What is up, everybody? Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. It is all irrelevant because we are joined once again by the one and only Perry Goldstein. You can find her on Twitter at Perry underscore Goldstein. She is back. It has been way too long. Perry, welcome back. How the heck have you been? New new place, by the way. Look at this amazing view that you have in the background. You've got so much to tell us. Tell us everything. New place. Yes, I moved uh that is my big update but it is so good to be back with you it's been so long i think we've both just been traveling and moving and uh, now our schedules have finally aligned perfect timing look at us so serendipitous to talk about real football because the Packers are back and you're at training camp yeah it's it's perfect timing and i think it's even more perfect because Uh, On Thursday, of course, no practice. We've had three training camp practices so far, and now we've kind of had the opportunity to reflect a little bit on these first three days. Obviously, no Jordan Love. We'll talk about that and kind of see what our initial takeaways are from these first few days of practice. Before I get there, I want you to tell us all about Pax What She Said on Cheesehead TV. A couple things. One, Cheesehead TV, obviously such an amazing partner of ours, as is Pax What She Said. Um, If you're not making Pax What She Said and Cheesehead TV part of your daily routine, just like Pack-A-Day, you absolutely should be. But tell us all about PWSS. Oh, thanks. Yes, so if you don't know, uh, starting this offseason, Pax What She Said is back with Cheesehead TV, which is so exciting. Um, We're very happy. We feel it feels like coming home. Um, we have just been covering the off season as usual. Um, we had Tom Grassi on the show a few weeks ago. So if you haven't checked that out, you should, Tom is also a friend of the show. If you don't know Tom, um, I don't know what you're doing. You are not on YouTube, I guess. Um, but Tom came on to talk about everything that he's been up to. Um, we've been scouting the NFC North and, uh, the rest of the competition, the NFC, and now talking about training camp. So we are going to like really be diving in. Um, we're going to have some extra content coming with Cheesehead TV this season. Um, so we're really excited about that, but just happy to be back with like Cheesehead TV gang. And um, yeah, it feels great. That's NFL fan of the year, Tom Grassi, actually. Yes. Uh, is, uh, so everyone should know him at this point, obviously. Exactly. <laughs> But no, make sure you're checking out both Packs with Cheese Said and, of course, Cheese Head TV every single day. Uh, Should have some collaborations coming up with Cheese Head TV this year that I'm super excited about as well. More on that on future dates. What we do not have, Perry, is a a agreement between Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers. Um, The phone is staying active by me the entire time, just in case we start getting a thousand notifications all at once and we know exactly what's happening. Uh, But Jordan Love is holding in. It's been a few days now. I think everyone for the most part is still in sort of this, eh, that's kind of like this annoying sort of thing, but no reason to panic quite yet. But Mm -hmm. every day that this goes on, it starts taking on a little bit of a different tone, a little bit of a different drama, a little bit of a different, just a little bit. And it it keeps kind of going in that direction. Just want to know where you're at. How are you feeling? Like, where are we at with this entire Jordan Love thing? I'm not bothered by it yet. It's fine. I think that this is a re- this is a huge, huge contract. It's going to take time. Um, I don't. I also don't think Jordan's contract is necessarily going to be just a simple like four year, fifty five mil, wrap it up, sign it off with a bow, like be done with it. It's going to be just a little bit more complicated and tricky, given like a number of different circumstances that I'm sure you and I on our various shows have gone through. Um, ad nauseum. So the reason I'm not concerned about it is a few reasons. One being both sides clearly have said they're getting this done. They're happy about it. They're excited about it. It's going to get done. It's just like a matter of communication and time. Um, And two, Jordan's there. I think that if he was in California, um, I'd feel a little more um, unsettled about the situation, uh, thinking maybe they're further apart or things are not going well. But He's there, he's at practice, he's smiling, he's happy, he's coaching everybody up. This is, I think, just a classic case of like his people, his agents being like, please don't get hurt until this is signed. Just like do this one thing for us. It's gonna get done, you'll be back. It's gonna happen soon and all will be well. Um, And he's just kind of going like, gotta do what my people say. Um, 
just the vibe around it doesn't seem negative. I think like we've seen negative contract talks before and this one doesn't feel that way. Um, it can veer in that direction the longer this takes for sure. If we get closer to, you know, padded practices and he's not out there or preseason games and he's still not signed, but we're still really far from that. So no alarm bells here. So that, that was kind of my next question for you is, and I've been thinking about this a lot and I'm quite honestly not sure I have a perfect answer yet. Where Where's that tipping point for you? At what point does it become, oh crap, this is like, it's this is not getting done and we have problems or just a lot more annoying or p- potentially detrimental to like the start of the season because this is going on for so long. And just as kind of a follow-up to that as well, how much does the sort of offense completely crapping the bed so far affect that as well? So two part question. I don't know if there's a line. Like, I feel like I can't say if there's a line it's like, I don't want to be like, if it's not done by preseason games, then this, cause I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, is he going to play in preseason? Like a series probably not. Does that mean anything? I think for me, it's more like, you want as many reps as possible with him out there with the offense as a whole. So the offense can gel. And I mean, you're there, right? Like you can see that like the level of competitiveness and play style and um, iron sharpening iron, if you will, with a Sean Clifford and a Michael Pratt, it's just not the same level. It just isn't. And it isn't going to be. And so for a team that has like very high aspirations. Like, again, you're not sounding alarm bells for like unpadded practices on July 25th, but the reps add up eventually and you want QB1 out there if he's healthy with the offense. Like, I think the offense practicing together over the course of a number of days does add up eventually. I just don't know what that eventually is. Yeah. So I was kind of looking at everything here. So today, as we're recording, this is July 25th. We've got what? 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 30, like five more days, six more days left of, of July. August 3rd is family night. So we're talking about nine, eight, eight, nine days up until family night. And then another seven days after that until the first preseason game, the first regular season game is on September 6th. So like in a way, you know, if, if he gets it done by like August 6th, which is still like what, almost like 10 days away ish, um, like 11 days away, like that gives you the first preseason game still, which I doubt they would play him like that quickly uh, as a turnaround. But like that gets you there before the first preseason game and still a full month before the season starts. Like, I feel like that would probably be okay. Um, but man, it like so to me, there's like these different spots. The, the, today, Thursday, as we're recording this, was kind mm-hmm. of the first one. The first three days, I've talked about sort of a glorified mini camp OTA. There's no pads yet. You're still getting ingrained into training camp. The practices are relatively short. They're not super intense yet. And then you had this off day on Thursday. And this kind of felt like a logical, you can get this done, padded practices start this weekend, and practices will start getting longer it felt like that would be a great spot to be like, let's make sure we get this done by now. So as soon as padded practices start, we're good to go. Um, as of right now at 8, 18 PM central time on Thursday, that deal is yet to take place. I like another part of me is like, all right, well, let's just give it one more weekend. Could they be ready for like Monday? I think Monday is actually an off day, but can they be ready for like Tuesday of next week? That gives them like another like five day window. I think that's kind of my next one. That next off date is the Monday next week. Like, can, can we get it done by then? Like that would feel like another, all right, it was a little bit like more slightly annoying than it, it maybe could have or should have been. But like, if it's done by Monday of next week on that off day, totally still fine. I think we're still in a good spot. I think everything after that, like now we're having to talk about, well, he's not going to practice that family night. Then we start getting to that next preseason game. Then we're pa- like less than a month to the season. And I, it just feels like there's these couple of like, um, you know, Cry, like not not like check I'll put checkpoints is probably a great way like these these checkpoints today was one Monday's one family nights one first preseason game is one and then I think now you start to like really get like okay this has got to really get done yeah I'm just like not going there I don't know 
I just no, don't think there's any point in going there. Like I hear you, you know, cause you, you obviously have to like think about those things, but I just don't think there's a point in going there until we get there. Like, yeah. I just have a feeling it's probably going to drop tomorrow, Friday. Like it's going to be a Friday news breaking story or it'll happen Monday sometime over this weekend. I, I'm just like not super concerned about it happening in a timely manner in order for everyone to like feel good about being prepared for this season. Cause it's like in nobody's best interest for that not to be the case. I think it's well said. I think it's totally fair. And I love the positivity and, and to be crystal clear, I, I still am very much in that same boat where I'd be surprised if we get to like early next week and it's it's not done. And I expect it to get done still sooner rather than later. Um, but a part of me did kind of think uh, by end of day Thursday, which again, th theoretically, there's still a few hours left in the day that Ian Rappaport tweet can hit any minute now and that'd be amazing. But um, I kind of expected it done at this point, but I'm still in a very positive mindset overall of I, I can't imagine this goes on too much longer. The, and here's the thing for me too is like, the Trevor Lawrence deals and the quarterback deals that have got done already should provide a pretty strong framework from a starting point um, mm -hmm. of, of where to go from here. And it just feels to me like, yeah, there's going to be some things that you nitpick on and sort of have to compromise back and forth. But it, the, the hard work has almost kind of been done for you with those contracts that have already been done. I'm just hopeful that, again, that it's not going to end up being too complex and this ends up dragging out too much further. What I wonder is what it is you think that they're having trouble with. Like if the blueprint is there and we know the ballpark of like base money, what is it? My guess is it's guaranteed money and cash up front is, is kind of my guess. Uh, the, you know, whether it's 55 million, 58 million, yeah, like those are important like details or 59, whatever it ends up being like, it's mm -hmm. going to be somewhere around the 55 million, give or take a couple. And like for Jordan, that's a, a still a huge deal, but for green Bay, like you're talking about over like a four to five year period, if they're $2 million off, we're talking about $8 million total. It's like almost a, a rounding error at this point in the scheme of things for green Bay. I, I don't think that that's probably going to play that big of an issue. I think it's money up front and, and guaranteed money and how, like, so how many of those years are like basically fully guaranteed for Jordan, making it that he's going to get paid and going to remain like the guy in Green Bay. Um, GMs, of course, as I always like to say, love to give themselves out just in case. And that's a good thing to do as a GM. That's a very smart thing to do. And players, of course, want to get as much guaranteed money as they can in case crap happens, which is a very smart thing to do on their end. And that's where I think sort of you get into these, well, we don't want to guarantee a full four years or a full five years because that's a long period of time and things can happen with injuries and things like that. And the player of course wants as much of that guaranteed as possible. So um, to me, the length is probably a little bit more negotiable. Um, and I think from both sides and again, in the thought process of green Bay wanting to give themselves maybe some potential outs and Jordan and his agent probably wanting to get another huge payday in three to four years. I think, you know, the length isn't going to be as big of a thing. I think the, like I said, the 54 to 58, whatever in there, like that is probably pretty easy compromise. I think it is absolutely the, the cash up front and the guaranteed money. Yeah, fair enough. And those are tough things. And yeah. like I've been saying kind of all along is. Green Bay is the only team that ever puts themselves in this situation. There's no precedence for this situation. And even the only other time that it's happened where you let this, you know, draft a, a quarterback to replace a hall of famer, you let him sit for three years and then you give him the reins and he goes out and crushes. It was Aaron Rodgers as the Packers yeah. doing it themselves. And that quarterback structure way back then is a million times different than what is now yeah. going on in today's day and age. So there's literally no precedence for this on either side. It does feel like there's good faith negotiations on both sides, but these are super complex talks and it's going to alter Jordan Love's life and it's going to alter the future of the Green Bay Packers for the foreseeable future because of this deal. These are things that you want to make sure you dot every I and cross every T on. Yeah, he also has an agent who like notoriously will just eat as much as humanly possible out for his clients, which good, he's a great agent, but it just doesn't surprise me that yeah he and, you, and, you, and you wonder like where the the breaking point is like for is is there a point where jordan says all right guys we got to get this done or is he just stay out of it and say hey it's, it, you can talk to my agent is there a point where green bay says 
all right, that's it. That's enough Sean Clifford for one off season. Like we just need to completely get this thing done and get it going. And if it's an extra 2 million guaranteed or whatever, we're, we'll just do it at this point. Um, it, it's all very interesting. And like I've joked about all week, uh, unfortunately we don't have all 22 film for the negotiating room to see where this is at and see who's right or wrong. It's just, uh, again, I think both sides are operating with the right mindset and it's just, these things are super complex. Yeah. I just would like it to be done so we can stop talking about it. Play. that would be beautiful and i mean i think that's i think part of this too is we were all insanely excited for the start of this training camp and this entire season and there's still so much excitement surrounding it and i think we all in the back of our minds know this is going to get done soon and it's all going to be forgotten about very quickly but like, like there's all this momentum and excitement and it just feels like yeah. there's this one little cloud that's just kind of hanging out there and it's just be like just go the frick away so we can just focus on everything else it doesn't even feel like a cloud. Like I would, I mean, you're at camp, so it like it's, the it's vibe not a is. Cloud. It's not a storm no. cloud. It's just, it's just, it's like it's, it's a white beautiful. cloud. It's just, it's, it's a just white like cloud. It's a really bright, beautiful, sunny day, and there's just like a one, one cloud. like white cloud that just is like there, and you're like. It's can go could you just go so that we got this perfect picture picture perfect yeah. view it's just like you're just being a little nagging and annoying it's not you're not you know causing any rain or storms it's just we just want you gone that's you're all it is my, you're blocking my uv rays <laughs> yes exactly that's exactly what this is all right let's talk about the contract that did get done before we get into more of training camp kenny clark's so we got the numbers uh so we know the full details of it now uh, obviously he had one year already on the deal it was a three-year 64 million dollar extension um, here, here's how I see this. And then you can kind of let me know your thoughts on the actual structure. So there's four years left on the deal. He'll be 29 in 2024, 30 in 2025, 31 in 2026 and 32 in 2027. I don't want to get too deep in the, into the weeds here, but let's say he, for sure, he's going to be here for two years, like 24 and 2025. You know, I want to get into the weeds, which is why you're yeah. laughing and smiling at me. Uh, <laughs> so we know he's going to be here for the next two years at least. And then the third and fourth year are going to be, probably be a little bit more based on performance. So there could be a restructure at some point here, but if he plays only the two years, he will get paid 63.7 million, which is 31.9 million per year, which is a pretty aggressive price, which will be broken down to 26 million this year, 20 million next year, and then 17 million in dead cap, probably over two years after that, if he were to only play two years. So 31.9 million per year. I think that's probably not super likely. Uh, three years, if he plays all three or three of the four years of the deal, he'll get three years, 85 million, uh, 28.4 million uh, per year overall, which seems probably about right. 26.4 this year, 20.4 next year, then 31.4 the following year, and 7.1 million dead cap the year after that is how that would be structured. And if he would play it out for all four years, again, going into age 32, it would be a four-year, $105 million contract, $26.3 million per year, which again feels like a, a, a right number, uh, 26.4, 20.4, 31.4, then 27.1 in the final year. My guess is how this plays out, Perry, is we see him play the first two years on the contract as is, and then in the year three, we start looking at a restructure of that contract in some capacity, and they kind of figure it out from there. Um, but thoughts on Kenny Clark's contract Do any of those numbers, it's going to be somewhere between 26.3 and 31.9 million per year. Are those strikingly high? Does it seem about right? Like how, how do you kind of feel about the, the numbers overall? I'm surprised at how much the Packers ended up paying him just given like the way that Goot was talking about the contract in general. I, I think I'd, I wasn't even sure it was going to happen, period. And that's not to say Kenny deserves it. Like, let's be clear here. He's like one of the best defensive tackles in the league. Um, I just didn't know if the Packers would pony up the money to make him one of the highest paid guys in the league. Um, we've been seeing some like major, major money. And for guys who are older too, right? Yeah. Um, like, and and we all make the jokes about Kenny's age, but – He's young. He, he's 28 right now. So this is not like a third contract for someone who's over 30. This is a third right. contract for a guy who very well could play through all the four of those years and stay healthy and be 32 by the end of this contract and still be rearing to go. I mean, considering his history uh, and the way it's gone so far in his career. Um, so it's deserved all of it. I think he's right where he should be. I just, I really didn't, 
expect the Packers to pay him at the level at that level. Um, I'm glad it happened. It sounded like it was a more difficult negotiation um, than we heard about. You know, he spoke yep. a little bit and he was like, I'm, I'm just glad that this is done so I can I can now focus on football and, you know, amen to that. Um, I agree with you on the restructure, but I think also just in general, that's kind of the way these things go. You get the big deal and then somewhere down the line, you know, the team needs some cap space and these are the deals that get restructured in order for the team to make cap space for whatever moves they want to make for that season um, upcoming. So upfront money is the way these players get the bag. Um, hence the conversation we were just having about Jordan Love, right? Exactly. So, um, so it's, 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 per- to me, it's perfect. Um, it brings him like right to that age where we'll see what happens, but Kenny's going to be a Packer for likely his entire career, which we just really don't see that often anymore. Not often at all. We'll, we'll kind of see how those next three to four years go. And, and hopefully that is the case. Uh, by the way, as we mentioned, Kenny will be 32 at the end of that 2027 contract. Should that come to fruition? Uh, Clayus Campbell uh, just signed again with the Dolphins. He's 37 years old. Now, Clayus is Right, exactly. I mean, Vita Vea, Chris Jones, yeah. like all of them are making huge money right now and they are well into their 30s. So it means, I mean, Kenny could get a fourth contract, you know, and he's playing at such a high level. He's coming off his most sacks of his career. I think he's going to eat in this Jeff Halfley defense. Like all of it is still trending upwards, which is wild for a guy who is again, like nearing 30. Um, somehow, somehow Chris Jones just turned 30. I would not have guessed that actually. Um, I would have guessed he was a little bit older, but he just turned 30. He, he, he does feel like another guy who's been in the league forever. It does. It really forever. does. But yeah, so I want to go back to your initial thought on this really quick before we kind of move on uh, to the next topic here. But uh, the, your initial thought of like, you were kind of a little bit surprised by the number yet very deserving. I'm kind of in that same realm. Like I, when I looked at the contract, I kind of thought that this was going to be like two years of like 25 million per year and then some empty calories after that, that maybe weren't actually a real contract. And it's really not it. Like I said, either like you're still paying them. Um, almost through the entirety of this. And unless he goes into that, you know, either that final year or the year before that, you end up with some dead cap hit and you end up paying him a significant amount of money. And like I said, even best case scenario where he plays all four years, he's still getting 26.3 million per year in that scenario. And um, I'm a little bit surprised, honestly. I'm not saying it's it's good, bad, ugly, or indifferent. I'm just saying I'm surprised that they went that far that long without a, a very clear and obvious way to get out of it. And just kind of, um, you know, move on. Like, there's really not that clear out in it to get you completely clear of it. They must feel like they won't need to. Yeah. I mean, and again, like Kenny's track record, he plays what, like 90 plus percent of snaps. He's, I'm knocking on all the wood on my desk, like almost always available um, and has been his entire career. He's just, he's Mr. Reliable uh, and he's, he consistently plays at a high level and you give these contracts. I mean, these contracts are a projection, right? You're not, you're, you are getting paid for what you've produced. Obviously you're, you have to produce at a high level to warrant a big contract, but you're also getting paid because they think you're going to continue to do so. And naturally they believe that Kenny is going to continue to do that. And by no means, I mean, we all watch him. Like we all believe watching on our couch that he's also going to continue to do so. Um, especially in the new defense. So I, I think it makes sense. Again, it's just like, it's just so not typically what this front office does for third contracts. Yep. So that's why it's surprising. But I, I think Kenny's just a little bit of an anomaly. I think his age plays a factor naturally um, and his production in combination. Age and availability for sure. Uh, we're, yeah. we're at the same page. And I think the cool thing is like, I don't know of anyone that's like, Oh crap. We've got three to four more years of Kenny Clark. Like everyone, like everyone wants this guy back. He's a consummate professional. He's the, he's the ultimate green Bay Packer. Of course you want that guy in your team. So I think overall, very good thing. We'll just kind of have to keep an eye on over the next few years, how that contract ends up playing out. And if it ended up being a good value or hopefully even a great value. Yeah. All right, let's move to actual training camp practice itself. We've got three in the books. What I want to start with Perry is because as I kind of talked about offline, I'm in the thick of everything. And sometimes you can't see the forest through the trees. And I want to know from your point of view, 
in the wonderful world of New York City. What has been <laughs> your most interesting thing outside of the contract situations that has been taking place at this Packers training camp so far? What's been the most interesting thing? Or what's been like, you know, marinating in your mind of like, all right, well, that like when you're getting the updates, when you're seeing the tweets, when you're clearly listening to the Pack a Day podcast 365 mm -hmm. days a year, what's been what's going through your mind? I am listening to the Pack, Pack a Day podcast every morning um, with your with your updates. Um, there's a few things. There's, I think, maybe three main things that come to mind. Okay. First is... I hate using this word and Alex Trof isn't here with us. So I'm going to use vibe? it. Vibe? Vibe? Yeah. The vibe. Like you said it before, right? It's just, you're going into this season and it's easy for all of us as we're talking about the team to get really hyped up about this team and what we hope that they can do and the expectations around it and everything that they have on paper. And then it's another thing to like actually watch it unfold um, while you're going through the off season, like we don't have nothing to go off of. It's just pure thought. And now they're there and you're there. So you can obviously speak to it more, but like you can feel the energy. You yep. can feel the energy like emanating from this team. Um, just the excitement and the, I don't know, just this like, I don't know if I felt it. There have been other teams that I think have been like really juiced up going into seasons, but in a much like different way. I think this team knows that like they put the league on notice last season and now they're going in and they got to like continue it. Um, and I love what the young guys, like the rookies especially have been bringing. I just love the way they speak about the team. Just all of it, just five. Um, have to laugh a little bit. Sorry, I'm no, using that. I'm word. loving it. Um, my next one is the defense. I mean, everyone's going to be eyeing this defense. Uh, naturally, when you switch coordinators, that's going to be um, top of the list for anyone. And again, same deal. We've been talking, 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 and now we finally get to see action. We got a little bit of it in OTAs, but we're not going to get the full Jeff Halfley experience for quite some time. He's not going to like throw the kitchen sink at us in an unpadded practice, but I kind of feel like we're getting a good look already. I mean, it feels like they've been dominant, aggressive, blitzing, just like all the things that we hoped it would be. Um, we're seeing, and this is a little bit, I temper my expectations because I think in training camp, you like to kind of test things out and just see, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks a little bit. And doesn't mean it's going to stay through the season, but just watching him rotate guys in, see who wants to be opposite McKinney, see who's going to be CB2, just all the, the mixing and matching. Um, so I'm just like loving the way this defense is, sounds like they're playing. And again, they're going up against not QB1. So we take yep. everything with a grain of salt. Um, and then my third biggest takeaway is just, it's lame, but like how important Jordan is. Like it's that. just not the same. Honestly, it's uh, it's just not the same getting updates without 10. Yep. Um, I feel like I can't really get too excited about anything this team does or anything this offense does specifically if 10 is not the one slinging the ball. Um, so as again, as like not worried as I am, we all just listen to my like soliloquy on how not worried I am about, about the contract and I stand by it. Um, I feel like you don't get like the full training camp experience. You don't get to really see what this team is without Jordan in there. It's just, it's at, it's at 98% right now. It's, it's funny because I talked about this a little bit the other day, but you know, somebody asked me on a, a radio hit of like, well, who's been standing out on offense? And I'm like, I got nothing. And the reason yeah. being is, and I talked about this too, of like the running game, you can't, there's no pads, there's no tackling, like, and it's so hard just even from the angle on the sidelines we're at of like, okay, I see that Josh Jacobs continued his run, but would that have been like a two yard run and tackled or like, maybe could he have broken a tackle there? But like th those things are just so hard to glean at this point, especially without any, even at least pads being on. Um, so the running game, you, you can't take much away from the passing game, all of the 
you know, weapons, the Wixes, the Reeds, the Musgraves, all that are affected by the fact that love's not out there. The quarterbacks have not looked great. And the offensive line's got their butt kicked for three days so far. So it's like, all right, what do you want? Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say from like a takeaway. And again, in large part, that is due to the, in, or like the players who aren't practicing and more specifically Jordan Love not practicing. On, and on the defensive side, your exact point, it's like, yeah, I can see a lot of stuff that's going really, really well. But how much of that is due to the fact that you're going up against Sean Clifford and Michael Pratt every day and Jacob Easton every day? That's not going to have the same like connotation. It's like, it's like winning an MMA fight against a five-year-old. It's like, it's, yeah, I won an MMA <laughs> fight, but he was five years old. Like I, you know, I should have been able to win that. Um, yeah. I don't know. It, it, I'm totally with you is I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. And like, again, it's awesome to have real football on the timeline and it's awesome to get the guys together. And I'm sure that there's plenty that they can glean from just being together, but the QB is the straw that stirs the drink. And it just feels, and I love that he's there and I love that he's out there and he's coaching everybody up. And I think he's doing absolutely everything that he could be doing right now, but it's just like, we're just, just waiting. I just want to watch him like throw the ball. It just feels like you're waiting for it to like be dialed up to a hundred. I'm not sure what the perfect meme is, but I was thinking about this today of like, I'm, I'm just like, it hit me literally of like, oh yes, we got practice again tomorrow. And then I'm like, oh, there's no Jordan again tomorrow. <laughs> like, it's just like this, like, oh, super excited practice. Yes, yes, yes. We get to learn more about this team and see them practice even more. And so excited. And then it's like, oh, that's right. They don't have a real quarterback that we're going to get to learn exactly what we should be learning at this point. So hopefully fingers crossed it all gets done and we can all go about our normal business per usual. Um, just really quick, my takeaways absolutely the energy and intensity on defense it is real it is tangible it is different we can't say exactly how this defense is going to play together and what level of success they're going to have but you can look at measurables of what a good defense does and i am seeing those things so far from this packers defense and that's all you can ask for at this point are, are you doing the benchmark things that the best defenses in the league do are you getting pressure yep are you stopping the run yep are you playing with a ton of en energy and intensity? Yes. Are you getting outflanked or, um, you know, countered to death because you're being too aggressive? No. Um, are you communicating well on the back end? Absolutely. Like all of these things that you want to see from a really good defense, we are seeing so far. And the big one too is like rallying to the football. Like there's any play that goes in any direction. You are seeing the team move together as a unit to rally and go to wherever that football is. And that is awesome. And then the other thing too is like, yeah, it's great. We want to play a bunch of single high and man coverage and things like that. Um, are you going to get beat deep down the field because you're going to be, you know, there's, there's more risk when you're doing that playing more man to man coverage on the outside. Nope. Like every single one of those plays, Jair's been there. The safety has been ranging over. Eric Stokes has been batting away plays. Carrington Valentine has been, it's been a cohesive defense. That's been playing the right way. And as I've said all week, not crowning anyone at this point, We've been burned before with being excited about defense, but I will absolutely go a million percent on the record and say, this feels different. It feels better. And I'm not making any predictions on it, but I'm seeing the things that I want to see from the defense so far. And that's all you can really ask for at this point. I was just about to say, I mean, you that's all you can ask for right now. Yes. It's practice three, there's no pads, and that's all we can go off of. There's yep. no games like that's it just we just have to take what's been put in front of us and say, like, do we like what we've seen so far? And all the answers have been yes. So and the, the, two other, the two other things are very much in that same mindset as well. Really excited about what Evan Williams has already brought to the table. Uh, I think his range, his smarts, his jump ball ability he went up in, in center field and got that interception the other day just some things that you see from veteran safeties are we're already seeing out of Evan Williams. And again, not saying he's going to all of a sudden be the starter or even a really good, whatever we've got to see how this plays out through a period of time. As I joked about the other day, I've seen guys like Alex light, Tim Boyle, uh, Raven green. I've seen a lot of really, you know, players have really good practices. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be great players, but I've really liked what I've seen out of Evan Williams so far. And then Eric Stokes, like I just wanted to see with Eric, 
him get back to the confidence and the speed and the level of player that he was as a rookie, which there were still things that he needed to work on as a rookie, which we sort of sort of saw the other day when he had the, the pass interference penalty and didn't get his head turned. That's been an Eric Stokes thing from time to time. But if he can play with speed and physicality and confidence and just use the raw natural tools he has at his disposal, that is what I want to see out of Eric Stokes. That's what I've seen out of Eric Stokes so far. And I see now a pathway where he can once again become the player that we saw as a rookie or maybe, fingers crossed, even taking a step forward from there. I'm not saying it's done. I'm not saying it's finished, but I think there's a pathway now to getting back to that point or better uh, based on what I've seen so far out of him, which is very exciting for me. I did love hearing like him going step for step with Christian Watson. Just like the big thing was like, is he going to retain his speed? Because that's that's so that's his thing. Um, and like whether he was going to be able to come back as the same athlete after this injury. And I mean, again, no pads, but so far it really sounds like he's bounced back so nicely and it was not a given, right? Because he struggled so much trying to get back on the field last season. And it was just like injury after injury, every time it felt like he tried to play. So we really did not know, but, um, so far, so so far, it sounds like more than good. So far, it sounds like really like the guy that you hope to get back. Agreed. I'm very about him. Yeah. Uh, two more things before we get out of here. The first one: Has there been anything that you've been surprised by, or that you just maybe didn't see coming, didn't expect? However, you want to take that, any direction you want to go, anything that maybe just caught you off guard a little bit from what you've heard from practice so far? Mm, honestly, no. But maybe. I've just like been to too many Packers practices at this point that nothing surprises me. Um, Maybe that I haven't like really heard a ton about special teams other than the kickers. Like the kicker rotation is odd to me, but you know, do what you got to do Packers, I guess. Like to me, it feels like I can't believe I'm going this direction. To me, it feels like Anders Carlson is going to win this job and they're just like kind of going through the motions of having competition. And I'm just kind of like, why not just like let the guy get all the reps? Am I off base on that? I do think they want it to be a legitimate competition. I And I think it is a legitimate competition. I just think he's winning it. Like meaning he's doing okay. well enough to like be the one that's like actually in fr- like not only in front, but I think well in front at this point. And I don't necessarily mind the fact that they want to continue to push them and be like, you better keep doing it. Or we've got two other guys. Like I'm kind of fine by that. And maybe, you know, before the first preseason game, they narrow that down to two guys instead of uh, three. And you just kind of go from there, but it absolutely feels like he is well in the lead at this point. I love to hear that. I'm rooting for Anders. Like, I don't, I don't want to see him fail. All right, so I have, I have two things that have slightly surprised me so far. I think the biggest, and we just talked about this kind of being a good thing, I, I really legitimately thought Valentine Stokes was going to be like an every yeah. other day swapping and seeing who ultimately wins that job. We've seen it at safety with Evan Williams and Javon Bullard. We've seen kind of a little bit of nickel linebacker movement between Isaiah McDuffie and um, uh, Edrin Cooper. We've seen it at right guard with Jordan Morgan and Sean Ryan. Like we've seen and are seeing some legitimate competition for these positions. And I absolutely, I would have bet a lot of stuff, Perry, that one of those competitions would have been Valentine versus Stokes. And maybe it still becomes that, but so far this very much as looks like Eric Stokes job to lose. And it seems like Valentine is just a step. I don't want to say like behind, but like he just, it seems like it's, it's Stokes' job right now. And I, that surprises me. It surprises me too, just given how well Carrington played last season. It, it and just like, like they were very complimentary of him in the off season too. Like we asked him to put on strength and he puts on a bunch of strength and hasn't really cut down on his speed or agility. And he's looked great so far in camp. He's got three pass breakups and three practices already. Like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm surprised it's not more of a competition. There has to be a thought process behind that. And I've been thinking a lot about this too, because that's one I was like, Oh, when I get to camp, like what are the things that I really want to watch for? And like, that's like one A on my list. Right? I'm shocked it's cornerback related. I am shocked that it's. Yeah. We're all surprised. Right. I mean, part of me is maybe they just feel like Eric Stokes just so was the one that was behind and just needs the reps so much more. But I also don't feel like that anyone they don't ever do anybody favors. Yeah. 
that's not like a thing that NFL teams do. You have to earn it. You have to win it regardless of if you're coming back from injury or not. So I'll always, I'll always remember too. And now this was a little bit different, I think maybe because it was the COVID year, but I'll always remember where like Chris Barnes was not in anyone's purview to start the season or like to through training camp. He was not with the ones ever. I don't even know that he like really worked his way up to the twos that much. They waived him in initial cutdowns, then brought him back after cutdowns. And he started week one in basically the entirety of the season. So like, sometimes I think they do hold their cards close to the vest at times. And like maybe mm-hmm. Stokes will be the guy at the, with the ones every day in practice. And then all of a sudden the week of they're like, Nope, it's going to be Carrington. Um, like th- there's things that could happen too. I was thinking about that the other day I th- for like another position, two of them. Like, I wonder who this year's like Chris Barnes could be where it's just, nobody talks about him the entire time. And then all of a sudden week one, he's just the starter. Like they, they do weird stuff like that too. You never quite know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, again, like nothing has really surprised me just because it's early training camp, right? So it's just like, let's just move guys around. And I said this before, but like, just see what sticks to the wall, like throw thing. You know, I, like I think about the O-line movement and we just, I feel like every day my timeline is just like some varying combination of like five offensive linemen names, yeah. right? And sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, that, that combo, that makes sense. That, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And then some combos I'm like, what are they, what they're doing? What? <laughs> what? You know, but that's just yep. what this time of year is. It's let's put Jordan Morgan at right garden, even though he's what I thought clearly a left tackle and see how it goes. And let's cross train Elton at center and, but not call it competition. Yeah. Not call it competition and let's just move everybody around and just like then we'll produce our best five by week one so that's why when you're like what's surprise i'm like but that doesn't surprise me that's just like a very packers thing to have happen just play musical chairs at this point of the year wherever the music stops you play there and then we'll play a few few plays that way and then we'll switch it up again <laughs> yeah exactly all right last question then we'll get you out of here uh pads are coming on this weekend you know, obviously it changes the calculus a little bit. What what do you want to see with the pads coming on? What do you want to maybe see differently or just what you're maybe expecting to see? Yeah, well, I mean, everything goes up tempo. Everything like gets like turned up a notch, like more high intensity. And so it's part like who can handle that and who steps up in that environment. Because it's very easy to like look great without the pads on. It's very easy to have your high speed, et cetera. You're not tackling none of that, right? Um I'm excited to see the running back group the most when the pads come on. There's been a lot of praise for AJ Dillon and how AJ Dillon looks. And I'm so pumped for him. I think every fan is rooting for AJ Dillon to make the comeback that we want to see from him. And he's been given an amazing opportunity to do so with Marshawn Lloyd hurt. Um, But I can't wait to see Josh Jacobs with those pads on. I mean, cannot wait. Um, again, that's another thing, like you kind of want Jordan back in order to get that, you know, chemistry going with Josh Jacobs, um, and then get Josh behind the offensive line, but, and not have the offensive line be mauled, et cetera. But, um, so I'm excited about that. I mean, I'm a little bummed that Marshawn Lloyd is hurt because he's also someone that I've just had my eye on like ever since they drafted him, but he'll be back. I think it doesn't sound like it's too... Crazy, but, yeah. Um, but I mean, just the running backs when they get the pads on are just a different breed, I think. Um, and just the defense as a whole. I think the defense as a whole, like I said, you know, they're flying around and being aggressive, they're doing all these things, but you get the pads on and everything looks very, very different. Um, so just more, give me more defense. See, I'm on the, I want to see this offensive line settle in. I want to see them. All right. Pads are on now. Maybe defense is a little bit of an advantage without the pads on. I want to see Jordan Morgan, Sean Ryan, Josh Myers, Elton Jenkins, Zach Tom, when he gets back to playing team activities, Rasheed Walker. I just want to see them start to gel a little bit, give those quarterbacks a bit more time and just see this offensive line start to come together and let's start figuring out that top five, but pads come on. Now I want to watch the trenches a little bit more and I want to see the offensive line settle into this because it's been uh, a bit of a tough start for them so far. Nothing to panic about, but I want to see them settle into it. Yeah. What's Zach Tom's timeline? Uh, my guess is it's going to be soon. You know, he's doing individual work. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's been any setbacks or anything, knock on wood. 
I don't know if it's like this weekend or maybe it's next weekend. I, it doesn't feel like it's going to be that much longer. Right. Yeah. I feel like he's a, he's a important little chess piece around where they put him and then how they move everyone around him too. Just in I, terms of talking about best five. I'll be shocked if he's not at right tackle. I'm going to be, I'll be absolutely shocked if he's not at right tackle. To start the season for sure. But yeah. with based on what they're doing right now in training camp, like I wouldn't be surprised if they move him around. Yeah, they could. It, the, the only thing that like, I think maybe would set that back is like just getting him back from injury. Do you just want him to stay at one spot? But yeah. with them, like you said, it's total musical chairs fest and you never know what they're going to do on any given day. So who the heck knows? And it, it very is possible too, that they get him some, you know, cross trained reps at center too. Um, because I don't know if you know this, but he's going to be a hall of famer there at center. So I did, I did hear that a little birdie told me. Yes. Um, amazing. Perry, this is awesome. As always per usual, tell everyone one more time where we can find all of your work and all about packs, which he said. Oh, you can just follow me on Twitter at Perry underscore Goldstein and, uh, the podcast at PWSS podcast, uh, packs, which he said on Twitter, uh, Instagram, YouTube, all the places, Maggie Loney and I are weekly and then twice a week once the season starts, which is very soon. Make sure to give them a follow. They're the absolute best. And uh, you're not going to want to miss the content every single week. Quick shout out to our Hall of Fame and All-Pro members, Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Bradad, Brendan Paletta, Jennifer Wright. I should have you read this. Uh, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Dan Miller, Alex Wong, Arnaldo Espinoza, Peter Ataka, Caleb Cookster, SoCal Pack, and Dan Gesford. That's going to do it for Perry and I, at Perry underscore Goldstein, at Andy Herman NFL. Until next time, and as always, go Pack Go. Go Pack Go.